Good afternoon. It's Friday, the 23rd of January. I'm Erin Viner, and this is IBA News broadcasting from Jerusalem. The controversy surrounding the invitation from U.S. House Speaker John Boehner for Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to address the Joint House of Congress is deepening. The offer was made without prior consultation with the White House. And, the, and Washington, the administration, has declared that neither U.S. President Barack Obama nor Secretary of State John Kerry will meet with the Prime Minister during his visit to the American capital. Uh, as a matter of longstanding uh, practice and principle, uh, we typically, the President obviously does not see heads of state or candidates, uh, neither will the Secretary of State in close proximity to their election so as to avoid the appearance of influencing a democratic election in a foreign country. So. Uh, the White House announced the president will not be meeting with Prime Minister Netanyahu and neither will Secretary Kerry when he's here. Although Saki's statement was diplomatic, outrage at the White House over the controversy is anything but, at least according to the Haaretz newspaper. U.S. officials told the publication that Netanyahu has spat in Obama's face and warned that the Israeli premier should remember that Obama has a full year and a half left to his presidency and that there will be a price to pay for his actions. Officials in Washington say that the derogatory term accusing Netanyahu of cowardice by an anonymous administration official several months ago was mild compared with the language heard in the White House when news broke about the Prime Minister's planned speech. In his upcoming address to Congress, Netanyahu is expected to focus on the threats posed to the world by Iran and radical Islam. Following the death early this morning of Saudi Arabian King Abdullah, the kingdom's next monarch, Salman, has already named Prince Mukrin as his immediate successor. Abdullah passed away at the age of 90 after nearly two decades in power. He participated in efforts to combat al-Qaeda and to modernize the ultra-conservative Sunni kingdom, although he was staunchly opposed to the wave of pro-democracy uprisings, seeing them as a threat to the stability of his own rule. Abdallah was also assertive in using the weight of his oil-rich nation in attempts to shape the Middle East far more than his guarded predecessors, particularly encountering the influence of his nation's rival, mostly Shiite Iran, wherever it tried to make advances. Abdullah backed Sunni factions against Tehran's allies in several countries, but in Lebanon, for example, that policy failed to stop Iran's proxy, Hezbollah, from becoming a dominant and powerful force. The colliding ambitions of Tehran and Riyadh often stoked conflicts throughout the region and inflamed hatred between the Sunni and Shiite Islamic branches, most horrifically in Syria's ongoing civil war, where the two countries support opposing sides. Those clashes helped to give rise to Sunni militancy, which in turn came back to threaten Saudi Arabia. And while the king maintained historically close alliance with the United States, there was still friction over several issues. He was constantly frustrated by Washington's failure to broker a settlement to the Israel-Palestinian conflict, and he pushed the Obama administration to take not only a tougher stance against Iran, but to more strongly back the predominantly Sunni rebels fighting to overthrow Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. President Reuven Rivlin is joining leaders from around the world offering praise of King Abdullah, saying that he served as an example of grounded, considered, and responsible leadership with a deeply religious tradition. As guardian of the holy places of Islam, Rivlin said that the Saudi monarch acted as a moderator who respected the sensitivity and sanctity of Jerusalem and sought to promote a vision of prosperity for the region. Abdullah's wise policies contributed greatly to our region, said Rivlin, and to the stability of the Middle East. Former President Shimon Peres, who is currently in Davos for the World Economic Forum, also eulogized the king. The death of his majesty, the king of Saudi Arabia, is a real loss for the Middle East and a real loss for the peace in the Middle East. He was an experienced leader and a wise king. And he has had the courage in a very demanding period of time to stand up and to introduce a peace process for the Middle East. I'm not sure that we could have accepted all the items in this peace process, but the spirit, the strength, and the wisdom invested in it impressed all of us and we thought it can be really part of a base for making peace. I admired his position, 
I think it has influenced many people all around the places. And I do hope that his legacy, as well as his proposal, will remain as a good memory for his long serving his own people and for a long time, an important one to bring peace to the Middle East. In other news, Israel will not tolerate any attempts to destabilize the northern border and will respond with force to any attack. That was the warning from Defense Minister Moshe Yalon today as he toured the frontier with military leaders while the army remains on high alert in the region. The IDF bolstered its presence along the Lebanese border yesterday in anticipation of a possible retaliatory attack by Hezbollah for an airstrike on members of the terror group and Iranian military personnel allegedly carried out by Israel on Sunday. Defense officials say that the IDF has mobilized ground and air forces to the border region and deployed Iron Dome anti-missile defense batteries throughout the north as precautionary measures. IDF Chief of Staff, General Staff Lieutenant General Benny Gantz also visited Northern Command Headquarters today where he said security forces are very alert, primed and highly prepared for any action that will be required of them. Meanwhile, in Lebanon, at least three gunmen were killed in clashes with soldiers near the border with Syria today. According to a Lebanese security source, the area of the attack has regularly been the site of incursion by Islamist gunmen fighting in Syria's war. The source said that the army responded with artillery after at least five soldiers were wounded when the group of gunmen launched a large-scale attack on a military outpost. Yemen's President Abd Rabu Mansour Hadi stepped down from power under pressure from Islamist insurgents who have been holding him captive inside of his residence. The downfall of the U.S.-backed leader is likely to severely complicate American efforts to combat al-Qaeda's powerful local franchise and is raising fears that the Arab world's poorest nation may now fracture into mini-states. Presidential officials say that Hadi chose to submit his resignation to Parliament rather than to make further concessions to the Shiite Houthi rebels who control the capital Sana and are backed by Iran. The Prime Minister and his cabinet have also stepped down. Houthi fighters are surrounding Yemen's parliament, which is slated to discuss the crisis on Sunday. According to law, the presidency should now be assumed by the Speaker of the Parliament, Yahya al Rai, who is a close ally of former autocratic ruler Ali Abdullah Saleh, who was deposed in 2011 but still wields considerable power and is widely believed to be allied with the Houthi militants. British Prime Minister David Cameron has called for more military training and ammunition for coalition forces battling the Islamic State during a meeting in London of the 22 member states confronting the extremists. Most often referring to the Islamic State by its Arabic acronym Daesh, all of the leaders underscored the importance of maintaining the international campaign against them, while Iraqi Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi warned that the drop in oil prices could negatively impact his nation's ability to help fight the jihadi group. Today's meeting confirmed the determination of our broad and united coalition to defeat not only ISIL, but also the ideology that underlies it, and not just in Iraq and Syria, but wherever it rears its head. We recognize that political progress in both Iraq and Syria will be vital in ultimately defeating ISIL in those countries, and Prime Minister Abadi updated the meeting on progress to date and the significant challenges remaining. We congratulated him on the progress that has been made in Iraq in the hundred or so days since he formed his government and re reaffirmed uh, our support for what he is doing. Most importantly, uh, we all confirmed our commitment to the struggle, however long it takes and wherever it leads us, to defeating the scourge of violent Islamist extremism. We all understand that Daesh, as it is commonly known in the Arab world, is not simply a Syrian problem. It's not an Iraqi problem. Daesh is a global problem. And it demands a coordinated, comprehensive, and enduring global response. And that's what we came here to talk about today. The coalition came together around the joint statement <coughs> that was uh, issued out of the meeting in Brussels. And that outlines our multiple lines of effort that we are currently engaged in. Uh, providing security assistance, uh, 
strengthening the capacity of Iraq to stand on its own, protecting our homeland, uh, disrupting the flow of foreign fighters, uh, draining Daesh's financial resources, providing humanitarian relief to victims, and ultimately defeating what Daesh represents, defeating Daesh as an idea, if it can be called that. Another issue which has been discussed today is the fiscal problem for Iraq. You know oil prices have dropped to about 40% of their level last year. Uh, Iraqi economy and budget relies 85% on oil, and this has been disastrous for us. Uh, I cannot stress this anymore, and uh, we explained this to our partners in the coalition, and I think uh, there, is, there will be a program to stand with Iraq in their crisis. We don't want to see a reverse of our military victory due to our budget and fiscal problems, and we have been assured that every member of this coalition will stand in Iraq in its fight against Daesh. Daesh is an, a terrorist organization. It knows, it, it knows uh, no race, no religion, no region. It spares nobody. So everybody must be facing Daesh. Turning to Austria, where the first trial against a returning supporter of the Islamic State has opened. Prosecutors say that a 33-year-old Chechen Magomed Z trained and fought with the radical jihadists in Syria between July and December of 2013 and sent the group $800. Interior Ministry officials in Vienna believe that half of the 170 people who traveled from Austria to the Middle East to join ISIS are Chechen. The defendant was shielded from cameras by four police officers wearing bulletproof vests as he arrived for the proceedings. The Russian national has pleaded not guilty to the charges that carry a possible sentence of 10 years in prison if he is convicted. His defense attorney insists that his client never fought with the Islamic State, but was a charity worker at refugee camps in Syria. The United Nations General Assembly made history yesterday by holding its first ever meeting devoted to anti-Semitism. The informal meeting was convened following a written request of 37 member states last October before the recent surge in European terror attacks, calling on the 193 member world body to send a clear message condemning the sudden rise of violence and hatred directed at Jews worldwide. French philosopher and writer Bernard-Henri Lévy gave the keynote address to the session which opened with a videotaped message from UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. This meeting has been prompted by the troubling rise of anti-Semitic attacks in Europe. But of course, anti-Semitism is one of the oldest forms of prejudice known to humankind. Over the centuries and across the world, Jews have been slaughtered and mistreated solely for being Jews. They have suffered banishment and exile, stereotyping and exclusion. They have experienced a full spectrum of abuse, from insidious bias to overt violence, including terrorism in supermarkets, homes, and houses of worship. The systematic murder of millions of European Jews in the Holocaust showed anti-Semitism at its most monstrous. One of the cardinal missions of the United Nations is to prevent such horrors. A United Nations that wants to be true to its founding aims and ideals has a duty to speak out against anti-Semitism. Our efforts to build a world of mutual understanding are being severely tested today by rising extremism and barbaric acts. The poison of hatred is loose in too many places. Jews remain targets, as do Muslims and so many others. Our responses must avoid perpetuating the cycles of demonization and playing into the hands of those who seek to divide. We must also avoid another trap involving the Middle East conflict. Grievances about Israeli actions must never be used as an excuse to attack Jews. In the same vein, criticism of Israeli actions should not be summarily dismissed as anti-Semitism. This only suppresses dialogue and hinders the search for peace.
Ladies and gentlemen, the fight against anti-Semitism is inseparable from our wider quest for peaceful coexistence and human rights for all. Where anti-Semitism flourishes, other forms of discrimination are sure to be there too. But when we counter anti-Semitism, we uphold our common humanity. The fight against anti-Semitism is a fight for all of us. Campaign news now, and four Arab political parties have announced plans to run on a joint list during the upcoming March 17th national elections. Khadash, Balad, Tal, and Ram will run together in the historic and unprecedented move in an effort to garner greater support after the raising of the election threshold to three and a quarter percent more or less necessitated the joining of forces to avoid the failing of independently running parties to gain any seats at all. Head of the mixed Arab-Jewish Hadash faction, Ayman Ode, was elected to chair the joint list. Masoud Ghanaim of the Islamist Ram is second, followed by Balad's Jamal Zakhalka, And as somewhat of a surprise, Balad M.K. Ahmed Timi came in fourth. The first female candidate on the list is Aida Turna Sleiman of Hadash, number five. Controversial Balad member of Knesset, Hanin Zawabi, is in the seventh slot, followed by the list's only Jewish member, Dov Hainan, in eighth place. While only 56% of the eligible Arab voters turned out for the 2013 elections, 70% now say that they will cast their ballots for a united Arab party, and most public opinion polls reflect that that list would win 11 seats in the Knesset. Returning now to the situation in the north and the strike on the Hezbollah Iranian forces on the Syrian side of the Golan Heights earlier this week was likely an attempt by Israel to prevent the forces from opening a new front to launch rockets at the country. This according to bar -Ilan University's chairman of the political science department, Professor Gerald Steinberg, speaking with IBA's Ari O'Sullivan. There are a lot of different schools. Hezbollah is, is complicated and difficult to read. Having said that, they're losing, they've lost about a thousand people, a thousand troops, hardcore troops in the war in Syria. That's not something that's trivial for them. So they are in, different, in many different ways weaker than they were before. Uh, that may also make them more desperate to show the strength that they, that they can de defend their interests, their people, in wanting to retaliate. But they've got to be careful on that. They, uh, the logic says they don't want to be drawn into a large-scale war with Israel, like 2006, where Nasrallah said on television, I miscalculated. There's a lesson to be learned there. I would separate between the rhetoric, the very intense, fierce, warmongering rhetoric of Hezbollah and what they're likely to do if they have a rational decision-making process, if they've learned the lessons in the past. Having said that, because they're getting battered, battered in different areas uh, after this, uh, where they lost not just Hezbollah but Iran, and the question is what's Iran's role? Is Iran going to push Hezbollah, the two of them together? How are they going to act to avenge the death of the Iranian general and, and the, the son of Monnier who, who was killed? Uh, how is that going to play itself out? And, and uh, there are clearly going to be voices within Hezbollah and Iranian leadership that say, we've got to show these Israelis that we can, have blood, uh, we can avenge the, the, the deaths of, of our, our martyrs, avenge their blood. So it, it's going to be, uh, I think, an ongoing uh, issue within the Iranian Hezbollah leadership, and Israel's got to be prepared for all the options. It seems they were trying to create a rocket station on the Golan Heights, on the Syrian side of the Golan Heights, as a way to strike at Israel. What do you think? Well, the big question is, what was this very high-level delegation in uh, half-tracks and, and, and jeeps going into uh, almost up to the Israeli border? And I think it is a very good assumption that probably the people who do intelligence here have more than an assumption that as they have fortified and used the border between Israel and Lebanon as a, as a base for mounting attacks, underground bunkers, missiles being launched, mortars in large numbers, the plan was probably, is probably, to do something very similar in the Golan Heights to extend the, the radius of the attacks against Israel. And therefore, regardless of who was in, the, in those vehicles, the fact that Israel sent a very clear message, a red line, no, we're not going to let you do what you did in Lebanon, we're not going to let you fortify this border and turn it into a, a point of aggression against us, is one that I think the Iranians and, the, the, and Hezbollah probably received. And Israel certainly now has, has made that very clear in terms of Israeli domestic policy, regardless of who becomes the prime minister after this elections. 
Turning to sports, and Israel's number one tennis player, Judy Sela's charm run at the Australia Open has come to an end. Rafael Nadal, one of the game's all-time greats and current number three, easily defeated Sela in straight sets earlier today in the third round of the Grand Slam tournament in Melbourne. After Nadal breezed through the first two sets, 6-1, 6-0, six six Sela put up a valiant fight in the third set before falling 7-5. This was the first time that Sela managed to make it past the second round of a Grand Slam tournament since 2009. In local finance, the shekel today put in a mixed performance in foreign currency trading. And due to the closure of the stock market on Fridays, here's a look at the closing numbers for the week. weather team tells us to expect mostly cloudy skies tomorrow, although our unseasonably warm temperatures are likely to remain with us until Monday. Here's the forecast at home and abroad over the next 24 hours. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. Laura Cornfield will be here tomorrow to bring you the latest breaking news from Israel. I'm Aaron Viner wishing you a great evening and Shabbat Shalom from Jerusalem.